Whew. Awesome. Amen. Good morning. Good to see you guys. You with me? Good morning. Isn't God good? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you guys once again for taking us to the throne. Love it, love it. Last week, we looked at how to put on our armor and put on from head to toe, right? Take up the shield of faith, even the offensive weapons. We're going to dive more into that, the sword of the, of the spirit later. But once we got the armor on, what now? You ever wondered that? What, what do we do? And that's why today we're talking about standing firm. How do we have courageous faith? How do we stand firm? And the first thing we need to know is you already have victory. God has already conquered that. That's what the cross was all about. He took it back from the devil and said, sit down. I got this. And, and, and he, he, took, he is victorious. He is on your side. He is for you. Now, the opposite side of that coin is there is an enemy, not so much, who is not for you. He is not looking out for your best interest. My wife sent me this cartoon, and I looked at it, and I said, oh, my goodness, Amy, this is perfect. This is exactly what I'm preaching on. I kind of think of the devil as these two buzzards here who are giving advice to this cute little bunny, like words of affirmation. You can do it. I believe in you. Just cross that road so you can hurry up and be dinner, right? Are the buzzards really having the bunny's best interest at heart? No. But sometimes the devil will come and whisper lies to us, lies that seem almost wrapped in truth but not quite. Remember, 99% truth with 1% lie, still a lie. Still a lie. And if a billion people believe a lie, it's still a lie. It's not the truth. And thankfully, God gives us his words, and he didn't leave us completely like a ship without a rudder without it. He gives us the sword. He gives us the truth. And at the potter's hand, man, we love God's word. We cherish it. We esteem it above. It is no book like any other book, and it is what gives us the ability to stand firm. And that's what we're looking at today. So I want to set the table. I'm going to give you the historical context of what we're about to read. So you can turn with me to 1 Corinthians 16, but don't read it yet, okay? Pull up your favorite Bible app while you do that. Let me welcome those who are joining us online, those who are streaming with us. God bless you. It is great to have you with us as well. 1 Corinthians 16, just hold your place there. As we look at Paul's letter here to the Corinthians, he's doing something unique here. He is writing basically a powerful, fairly long, mm, gentle spanking, right? Like a velvet-covered sledgehammer. Because the church in Corinth, of all the churches he dealt with, including the ones he started, the church in Corinth was one, let's just say they put the fun in dysfunctional. They are that church. They are the ones that, of all of them, probably gave him the most heartburn. And so what he does is he starts hearing all these things going on in this church, and reports start filing in, like, Paul, man, you need to do something about that church in Corinth. You need to get on over there and straighten that out, because they're doing some funky stuff, stuff that I just don't think that that's what the Lord had in mind. And Paul starts hearing these things. So what he does is, we got to remember what the city of Corinth was. Let, let, me, let me do a little justice here. Corinth was like the modern-day Mardi Gras, okay? Only it was every day. 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Corinth, every worldly, carny, fleshly, evil, sinful desire you wanted, you could have in Corinth, okay? It was sin city. It was, it was emerging. It was powerful. It was, it was the place to be seen. In fact, if people came up to you and said, man, you are living like a Corinthian, everybody knew exactly what they meant. That meant you are wild. You are living on an indulgent self-absorbed, sinful, hedonistic lifestyle, okay? So that's what Paul is dealing with. So he says, all right, I'm going to write you all a letter, okay? And he's firm, but he's always loving. I love that about Paul. So Paul writes this long letter, and what he does is he addresses each problem. In fact, six times he says, now concerning this. And then he goes, do, 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 and he goes and gives godly wisdom how to stop doing that. Then he moves on to the next topic and says, now concerning this, blah, 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 ba do, ba do, ba do. Now concerning this, boop, but he does that six times. And he goes through and he just, it's like a punch list. He just knocks out these things. He spends 16 chapters doing this. And then at the end of it, he, it's almost like he comes back around and he wants to summarize everything. And he does it in a beautiful, short two verses. And that's the two verses we look at today. Okay, so here's his summary of all of it. Read with me here. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. He says, be on guard. Stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, and do everything with love. 
The New King James says this, let all that you do be done with love. Don't you love that? Stand firm, be strong, be brave, be bold. So here we have this wild and crazy party city, and Paul's given these, these great directions to the church of Corinth, and then Paul comes along, and he shares some advice that is really flying in the face of the culture. He's going to come along and give some detailed wisdom, how to live a life of holiness in a city that, let's be honest, doesn't really care if you live a holy life. Does that sound vaguely familiar? Absolutely. It's where we are today. Is anybody applauding when you stand up for, for God's truth and his gospel? Not at all. If anything, man, you're getting pegged with fruit and babies. Sit down. You intolerant, narrow-minded person, sit down, right? Now, I mean, it's true. That's exactly what was going on here. So Paul writes this great letter, and he's saying, church, you need to be on guard. You need to be aware. When you are surrounded by sin and temptation, stand firm. I know you're walking in it, and you're swimming in it. You go to work, and it's, it's not like church. And you go out, and you're hanging with your coworkers, and it's not like church people. And you go to these movies, and you see stuff, and you're like, that's not church people. And, you know, on and on. Paul's saying, stand firm. And sometimes, this is going to sound counterintuitive, a warning. Sometimes standing firm actually means you don't stand at all. You run, you flee, or you kneel in prayer. Sometimes standing firm is so counterintuitive. Look for God's way to provide that escape. When you get on an airplane, first thing they do, my dad just landed in uh, Australia this morning, and I guarantee you when he got on, there was some person standing up front going, right? right? And they're doing it, and you're not listening. You're not paying attention. That's why it sounds like Charlie Brown. Wah, 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 wah. What was that? They're pointing out the emergency exits. Now, if you listen to that, good for you. You're not paranoid. You're smart because you want to know where your emergency exits are. Now, me, safety pup, man, I'm taking notes. I'm like, why? I'm like, did you get that? Did you get that? Because I'm, I'm not a big flying guy. It's not my thing. I'll take a train to Australia. If I can find a way, I will, I will find a way to do it. You know, I'm not paranoid. I just don't know the guy flying me. All right. I have trust issues. I admit that. Confession is good. Paul comes along and he's giving us advice. He says, guys, the first clue to standing firm, recognize your escape. You need to look for it. Recognize your escape. And then he goes on and he cites this beautiful verse that you know, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. He shares this. He says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful, and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, he will also show you the way of escape so you may be able to bear it. Y'all, that is good news. That right there, you know what that says to me? That says that God has his hand on the holy thermostat of my life. His hand is there, and he is not going to allow the temperature to get too hot to where I crack. Now, in my flesh, I might think there's no way I can survive this. But according to his word and his promises, which we know are true, he says, I am, I am measuring what I allow the devil to bring against you. And I am not going to let it get out of control. And when you think it is, watch for my escape door. Watch for that hatch. I will provide it. Now, that is a deep thing. When, when we are tempting, to, it, it's reassuring to know, man, God is measuring what he allows the devil to come our way. And he is keeping control. We can handle it with his grace. Thankfully, we don't have to rely on our own shaky faith. We don't have to rely on our flesh. Man, willpower, pff, come on. You put some brownies in front of me, my willpower is gone. That's just the way it is. You add pizza to it, pff, you know what you get? Heartburn, right? Yes, yes. And that's it. Well, aren't you glad you don't have to rely on your willpower? I'm going to do this. I'm gonna, we're going to just, you can't. No, no. If you've ever tried to go up against the enemy in the flesh, it's a losing proposition. Thankfully, God gives us victory. But we have to be willing to look for it. Being, standing, and, and living in a firm way when your sand is shifting all around you is not easy. Let's be honest. This culture is not cheering you on to living a life of holiness. Man, I get it. I get it. It impacts me. It's not just you. We see it everywhere. Being a Christian isn't easy. Even the great theologian, simply known as the man in black, knew this when he said, being a Christian isn't for sissies. It takes a lot more of a real man to live for God than it does to live for the devil. That's Johnny Cash, by the way, the man in black. Time after time, we see this, where God provides a way of escape for his children, and it didn't look easy. 
Y'all remember back to the Israelites when they're being pursued and the Egyptians, man, they're coming down and they're chasing them and they're beating their chariots and here they come and all of a sudden there's a sea blocking them and there's mountains on each side and they don't know what to do and here comes the army. What does God do? Supernaturally, in a miraculous way, he provides a way of escape. Not only that, but he took care of his enemy. Man, that's awesome. Time and time again, we see that. All throughout biblical history, we see, man, they were starving. They were hungry. Woo, wake up in the morning. Well, look at that. God provided food, food, angels' food from heaven. Not enough to store up, just enough for that day. They were thirsty. What does he do? Hey, I want you to go hit that rock. Boom, beats rock, splits open, water comes. He took care of things. He did it in miraculous, huge ways, and he may do that for you. He may do something small, but that escape hatch is there. So when the most devilish temptation shows up at your doorstep, we are without excuse to say, sorry, God, I, I just couldn't help myself. I just, I just had to give in. No. Remember, we're not alone in this. God didn't leave us. He didn't leave the Israelites. We must resolve and make up our mind to trust God and look for his way of escape. Look at what Galatians says here. Paul says this in Galatians 5. He says, walk by the Spirit and let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves, those desires of the flesh that are so bad for us. The Greek word used here is parapateo. Parapateo. Say it with me. Parapateo. Not pair of potatoes. Parapateo. What this means, it literally means treading out the ground beneath you. It literally means like you are to walk around in a large place, stamping down the ground, as if you are staking a claim for Christ. Boom. This is my ground for you, Lord. None shall pass. Gandalf is there with his staff raised high. You shall not pass. That's what this is. He is stamping out his... You know what this reminds me of? Anybody ever seen one of these right here? Oh, these things are so cool. What are these called? Crop circles, right? Man, we're so confused how these things happen. Aliens. Aliens come down, and they do these little hibbity flibbities and they do these things that's so beautiful, and then they disappear. April, did you get that picture? Okay, April has a picture of the aliens actually doing this. I think we actually have a live shot. Okay, here it is. This is, this is how it happens here. This is not how it happens, but I want you to look at this right here. This rope and this two-by-four that the alien is stamping on. Here's another way that these are made. Anchor it in the middle, and then you can go around and you can flatten these down. This is what I picture when I hear that Greek word parapeteo. When you are stamping around in the ground saying, God, I claim this ground for you. I resolve to not be moved. I am not going to give in to my... I stand firm. I choose this day to walk in obedience. Did you catch that? When you wake up in the morning, that needs to be our prayer. After we put on our armor, after we put on every piece, Lord, I choose this day to say no to the enemy. I resolve to this day to stand firm, to be obedient even when it's inconvenient. God has made us free moral agents. That means we have free will. The devil cannot make you sin. He couldn't make Jesus sin, nor can he make you sin. Here is the dirty secret, okay? I'm just going to do it because we're safe here. The doors are closed. We can take off our masks, and we can breathe easy, okay? Listen to this. This is, this is a truth grenade. The reason why so many of us blow it, the brutal, honest, can I be brutally honest? Nod if it's okay. All right, not everybody nodded. Okay, I won't do it. Then. Can we do it? Yeah. The brutal, honest truth why some of us continue to blow it. We enjoy sin more than obedience. The brutal honest truth is we can become so enamored with the sin that we are blind to our escape. You feel me? We can become so focused on it. Oh, I can't get off this one website, Lord. I just can't do it. I'm so enamored. I'm so, uh, where's that escape? Well, man, you just blew by seven of them. Good night. The pastor knocked on the door. You had people come over. Your mom and dad brought you cookies. There's all kinds of escape hatches. Oh, pastor, I just, if I just fudge this one number, do you know what TurboTax does to my refund? Are you kidding? It goes from red to green. It's like whew, payday. Well, is that really a life of integrity? Oh, sorry, it gets real quiet in here. But that's, that's what we're talking about. By God's grace, we don't have to be enamored by that sin. We choose it. We choose it. That's so wrong. 
but we do, which is why it's so important that we come and we have the church and we can lift each other up. Remember last week when somebody falls, we don't kick them. We say, been there, done that, get up. Boom, here's my shield. You, poof, put your shield. Boom, hammered into the ground. Now you form this tortoise shell wall with these six foot tall shields and we help the brother up. And we say, pick up your sword, man. We need you in the battle. Are you ready to fight again? All right, here we go. And that's the whole reason for us coming together, forming this great body of Christ where you are safe here. Next admonition Paul gives us, remember what's to come. Oh my goodness, if we could just get this in our mind, if we could remember the reward. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no one has even imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Don't forget what's to come. The glory that is being stored up for you. Remember, temptation is not unique to you. The devil wants you to think that. Moses was in line to rule Egypt. And not Egypt like today, where it's kind of dusty and we're like, eh, you can have it. But Egypt like, cow, like there's the pyramids, there's the gold, there's the fame, there's the wealth. It's incredible. Man, yeah, I want to be ruler of Egypt. And this was handed to him on a silver platter. And Moses was able to resist the temptation that the devil was putting before him and look past it at the eternal perspective. Wow, could you? Man, I don't know about me. I'd probably sit there with my feet up, somebody fanning me, feeding me bonbons and stuff. That's, that, that sounds really good, right? Sorry, too honest? Okay, that's, that's, how, that's how Moses had this presented. Moses looked to God's eternal reward, and he was able to resist that temptation, the temporary devilish temptation that was laid at his feet. And here's the rub, guys. One reason we fail to stand firm is we lose that eternal perspective. That's it. We lose that eternal perspective. We get so short-sighted, we start looking. We have some investment experts. Elliot, right here. <laughs> when the Dow drops a couple points, I promise you, this guy, and some of you, if you do this, I know you get calls from panicked people going, what's going on? Oh my goodness, we got to sell all. We got to get rid of it. Sell it. Abort. She's going to blow. And they run and they cover and the Dow goes back up, right? What happens? They don't take the long view. But isn't that what we're supposed to do, right? Take the long view. Quit looking right here. Moses didn't. Jesus didn't. He looked past the cross knowing what his assignment was. That's our goal. But we're so bad, man. We're so tunneled. Y'all see those horses with those little blinders? Man, that's, that's not how we're supposed to live this unless our gaze is fixed on just Jesus. Remember what is to come. Let me give you a very spiritual, serious analogy, okay? Just play something out here. Y'all know who Michael is, the archangel, right? Stunning, huge, strong, the archangel, glorious. If he were to show up to you at lunch today, okay, <laughs> right in front of you, okay, after you recover from your heart attack and you saw his brilliance and you resisted the urge to fall and worship him because that's what humans did time and time again because angels are just a glimpse of God and so far inferior to him, but we even worship them and we're so messed up and boom, and he says, greetings, earthling, or whatever he would say. <laughs> he said, probably wouldn't say that. Whatever he would say, hi, okay? And he says, I come from the courts of heaven. I just came from the Father, from the throne room, and he gave me a message for you. And the message is this. The Son himself is rising from the throne, seated at the right hand of the Father, and he is coming tomorrow for his church. And when he comes here is his message. That mansion that he said, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come and get you. It's ready. It's done. And he's coming tomorrow, and his reward is with him. Stand firm today. Do you think you would probably be able to resist temptation for the rest of that day? Absolutely. Why? Because you knew your reward was near, and you knew it was real. Your perspective was no longer right here. It was on something far greater. It was on a heavenly perspective. And your faith was strengthened. It was bolstered. You were able to stand firm. You were able to not take that temporary gratification. You were able to delay it and look for that reward. Y'all remember a couple years ago, I did a series called Shark Week. It was on resisting temptation, and I share with you the marshmallow experiment. If you don't remember it, here's a 60-second uh, summary of it. These poor souls were tortured with a marshmallow sitting in front of them. 
And they brought in 600 little kids, little elementary kids, one at a time. They put them in this room, and they put a marshmallow in front, and they said, don't touch. If you can resist eating this for 15 minutes, we'll come back and we'll double your reward. We'll give you two marshmallows or any treat you want. It could have been Oreos even. They actually could let them pick. Or you could eat it now if you want and be done. The majority of them did not make it to the 15 minutes. I think almost 500 of them failed. Now, here's a picture of what they went through in this next one. Here's this boy. Let's just walk through these emotions. Oh, you got to be kidding me. I got to wait how long? Mom, you praying for me? And then he goes on, and we see these next photos. Yeah, I can do it. I can do it. I'm so, please, Lord, help me. This is so temptation. And how much time? It's only been a minute? Really? And then he goes on. And he's like, you know what? I'm just going to hold it. I can't see it. I can't see it. Maybe if I just sniff it, if I just smell it, I'll be okay. And home. Oh, it's gone. He gone. That is the marshmallow experiment. They could not delay gratification. They didn't take the long view. If they had just waited 15 minutes, they'd have two. Home, home. Nom, nom. You'd be able to eat all those wonderful, delicious foods of the gods known as marshmallows. If it was Krispy Kreme, we all know that none of us would survive longer than a second. This is the marshmallow experiment. Take the long view. It will be worth it. Keep your heavenly perspective. The next admonition for standing firm is this. Don't follow the crowd. Don't do it. The crowd is almost always wrong. Here's your scripture for you. Look at Matthew chapter 7. I'll put it up for you. It says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter that. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. See, in New Testament times, roads, public roads, were 16 cubits wide. This is a cubit from here to here, so we're talking over 20 feet wide. Those were broad. Those were easy to stay on. When a horse carriage came your way, man, you could move aside, you could stay on it, nothing's going to get you off. It's easy. It didn't take any discipline to stay on that. But private roads, private roads were four cubits wide. That's like for me to Eric wide, okay? It is when somebody comes, there's something coming, man, you gotta, you gotta, it takes intentionality to stay on that road. It was not about just whatever comes, whatever's easiest. This is such a beautiful example. A common reason that Christians fall into temptation today is this broad road mentality. You know what that is? That's where people buy into the lie, well, everybody's doing it, pastor. So it, it can't be that bad. Ever heard that? Ever had your kids say that? Ever been the kid that said that to mom or dad? I mean, it can't be that bad. Come on, everybody's doing it. I mean, it's, surely it's not, it's not that big a deal. It has to be okay. Y'all, this is one of the favorite lies I would, I would wager here of, of the devil. One of his favorite ones. Come on, guys, group think. Y'all, just go in. Just follow that. Remember this. This is probably why the mighty Peter was a roaring lion one minute and was denying Jesus the next. Think about this. He vowed, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. Matthew 26, 35. I love what Doug Batchelor says about this. He, was, he did a commentary on this. He says, have no doubt that Peter was sincere. Have no doubt. He meant it. When he said it, I believe his heart was pure. I believe he meant, Jesus, I will follow you till the end. But here's what happened. When Jesus was taken into the judgment hall and separated from Peter, Suddenly, it was no longer popular to be with Jesus. <laughs> Here's what happened. Peter now gathered with those who mocked Christ. Peter now gathered around the campfire, and something strange began to happen. Are you ready for this? Write this down. The longer he stayed, the easier it was for him to act and talk like Christ's enemies. The longer we surround ourselves with people who are absolutely unyoked with us, unequally yoked with us, do not be surprised if they start to rub off on us. That's why it's so important that when you do your evangelism, when, you are, when you're working with people that you don't go into situations that you know you're setting yourself up for failure, where you are outnumbered 10 to 1, 20 to 1, and all it's going to be is ridicule and mocking. Take people with you that believe in you, that stand with you. When we let the crowd establish our values, we become like the crowd. 
That's not what God's called us to do. The Bible says the crowd's not just often wrong, it's usually wrong. Broad is the way to destruction. Narrow is that tough way. You can only enter through the narrow gate. If a billion people believe a lie, it's still a lie. It's just a billion people wrong about it. Be the one that stands up. The more you love Jesus, the less the attractions of the devil will entice you. That is so profound. The more you gaze into his awesomeness, the less these trinkets and shiny little lures and baubles and bangles and doodads will distract you because you're gazing so intently into the heart of the Father and nothing else matters. You always have a choice. Another way to stand firm in our walk with the Lord is so simple, but we miss it. You ready? Two words. Stay busy. Stay busy. Now you think, oh, that's easy. Whoo, got one. Check that one off, pastor, right? No. <laughs> It's simple, but it's not easy. This is not a call to stay constantly on the go. This is not an urging to stay endlessly busy with random and trivial and lesser pursuits. That is not this at all. What this is is a call to stay engaged in worthy pursuits, to fill your time with things that are noble and uplifting and things that benefit the kingdom and things that are enjoyable. Stay active in good things. There's an Italian proverb that says this. See if you can decipher this. He that labors is tempted by one devil. He that is idle by a thousand. In other words, what he's saying here, he who works hard has time only for a little temptation. But he who sits around and doesn't do that will find himself tempted by all kinds of wrong. Y'all remember when your grandma used to say, idleness is the devil's workshop, right? Right? Your grandma was smart. That is so true. So many people, we can't stand to be bored or idle because God created us for activity. And when a person doesn't have anything to do, chances are the devil will gladly help you find something to do, something to fulfill your carnal and fleshly desires. An idle person is almost inviting the devil to come and tempt him. That's why being bored is, can be so bad, especially when you're home by yourself and you're looking for something to do, and you're lonely, and you're bored, and it's epidemic. I can't tell you how much I am dealing with this with so many good people. Idleness and emptiness. Ephesians 5.15 addresses this. Let's look at God's word. It says this, y'all be very, I added the y'all, by the way, that's not there. So be very careful how you live not as unwise, but as wise. Make the most of every opportunity. Why? Because the days are great. Because days are so good. No. Days are, what's that last word? Evil. Wow, that's God saying that. We have his permission to say, to agree with that. Say, man, look around. Things are tough. Sin blossoms in the human mind. We talked about this two weeks ago. This right here is the danger zone. This is where things germinate. It's designed to concentrate on one thing at a time. Stay busy. Stay focused on doing something good, like serving others, helping the poor, sharing your faith, being at church. We don't have time to do evil. Someone once said this, strength to resist evil is best gained through aggressive service. Man, I love that. One of the ways to stand firm and stay out of trouble is to be aggressively involved in serving Jesus. If you're doing that, you don't have time to do silly things. So let me ask you the question. Are you having trouble right now overcoming some sin in your life? Are you having trouble right now achieving victory over some weakness, over some sin that seems to have entangled you? If so, surround yourself with people who bring you up. If so, Make sure your circle of friends includes like-minded believers. Run to the people who can help. Run to the place that can help, not from it. Because the devil, here's what he does. He wants you to run from it. And then he whispers his lies. Are you kidding? You did that? Man, you, you, are you, you're worthless. You call yourself a Christian? Are you kidding? You can't. Here's a secret Satan doesn't want you to know. Okay? You, you might even want to write this down. When the church doors are open and believers are gathering, simply showing up is half your victory right there. Simply showing up with people who have your back, simply showing up is half the battle because he knows what you're going to get. You're going to get love and encouragement, and you're going to get God's unbridled truth, and you're going to get worship, and you're going to get to his throne, and all these other things are going to 
fade out of existence when you gaze into his majesty. Oh, God knew what he was doing. He told Adam, by the sweat of your brow, you're going to have food to eat. This is after he fell and we sinned. He looked at him. He, God knew. He knew it would ultimately be a blessing to stay busy and not a curse. He knew how we would be. The last admonition to standing firm, and this one seems even easier, the easiest of them all, but it's not because we neglect it. I hate to say it, but here we go. Four words. Care for your health. All right. Woo. This is an easy one. Hmm. Have you ever noticed when temptation likes to come knock at your door? Have you ever noticed? Y'all, this is like a master's class. This is so good. It comes when you're at your weakest. It comes when you're tired, or it comes when you're sick, or your health is failing, or you're worn out, or you're stressed beyond the max, and you're at the limits of your patience, and you just want to scream, and you get away from everybody. It's so easy to make bad decisions then. The devil knows this. We all have these mornings where, frankly, it is all we can do to simply put one foot out of the bed and then the next, right? We all have those mornings where it is the hardest thing, where it's like a major accomplishment if we can get out of bed. In fact, I actually have a photo of a church member just this morning trying to get out of bed. Mission, get out of bed, status, close enough, good, good enough, right there. We all feel like that. We all have days like that. That's okay. It happens. That's why it's so important to be on guard and stand firm. It's easy for us to give into the temptation when maybe our stronger and healthier state, we would have said no. But because we were weak and the devil knew that, we need to know that about ourselves. Stand firm. Now, here's your hidden gem about this. When did Jesus' temptation come? Oh, after 40 days of hunger and thirst. 40 days. Think he was hungry? Think he was, that's when Satan showed up. Notice when Satan didn't show up. He didn't show up at the temple when Jesus was well-rested, well-fed, and preaching his heart out. He didn't show up there. That's not when Satan comes and tempts me. He's not right here. You know, like, ooh, hey, you want to cheat on your taxes? I'm like, no, get away, right? He comes at the weakest points, when we're tired, when we're stressed out, when we are, mm, that's, when, that's when Peter denied Jesus. Remember, he said, man, even if I have to die with you, I'll do it. What happened? He stayed up all night the night before with Jesus, or he tried to, tried to pray with him, right? Man, he was worn out. And the longer he stood by that fire, the more his resolve crumbled, and he started to look and sound just like those who were mocking him. This is Peter. Peter, not me, not you. Peter, the rock. Think about that. That should give us hope. That should give us hope, y'all, that if that happened to Peter, man, and, and he was restored, that is so good. Our basic ability to resist temptations is greatly influenced by our health. Mark it down. It is so true. When you know this, whether it's simple lack of exercise or sickness or chronic fatigue or burnout, when our reserves are drained, we tend to react in ways that our stronger self wouldn't. I'm doing a lot of couples counseling, and I tell you what, this is free, no charge. Most marital, I'll call them disagreements, <laughs> happen at the end of a day when one or both are tired, when one or both are hungry, or when they're tired and hungry, and then they are hangry, right? That's when most marital spats happen. That's when they happen. Why? Because the devil knows, and he comes to you. Jesus said this in Matthew 26, 41. He says, guys, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. Because your spirit, man, it's willing. You're right on, dude. Your heart, I feel you. I got you. Your spirit is willing. But your flesh, not so much. <laughs> your flesh is weak. Anybody, anybody brave enough to admit your flesh can be weak? Yeah, yeah, just me. That's okay. That's all right. I can get that. This is so simple, so basic, and sometimes we just need a reminder, y'all. Get sleep. Eat healthy food, Krispy Kreme diet, come on, that's not, that's not it, all right? I'm talking to myself here. Avoid running to comfort foods and insane sugar doses before you got to make a big decision. All that does, thank you, Louise, all that does is plummet you, man, and you're worse. Then you become cranky and irritable. No wonder you're not at your best and you're making horrible decisions. Plan ahead. Guard your time. Guard yourself. Include some exercise, even if it's a walk around. Man, my whole family's going to refit. Y'all, that's... That's awesome. I've lost like, I've lost some weight. And it is, it is, it is great. The family that exercises together doesn't die, right? That's just how, it, how we look at it. And it is fantastic. Do something. Do something. I can't wait to go see my doctor. 
I get to go see him again. Last time I was there, he said, oh, Matt, oh, I love it. Your lifting weights are great, but your cardio is terrible. You need to do three hours. You need to do three hours, hour, three a week. I got two of them down with refit, and I got to work on one more. So y'all help me with that. But I know my cholesterol is going to be down. I know my blood pressure is going to be down. I'm actually excited. One of the reasons why we try to be at our best for you on Sunday, for the Lord, is we view this as Super Bowl Sunday every week. Our preparation, I'm just sharing a little candid openness with you guys. Our preparation for this moment starts about 24 hours before this. It affects what we eat on Saturday, so I'm at my best. It affects what we do, where we go, when we go to bed, the entertainment we put into our minds starting around Saturday, around 1 or 2 o'clock, and we all start gearing up. We lay out our clothes. We make sure we're ready. We have the kids. We're not going to have that devil step in, be one of those things where we're hating each other driving in the parking lot. Stop it. I can't stand you. Get up. How you doing? Hey. That's so good to be here. You know what? And don't look at me self-righteous. You know it. You know it. We've been there. We take steps, man. This is so important. We want to be at our best and let God speak and let God do it. Now, what happens? Knowing all of that, what happens, Pastor, if and when I do fall? What happens? It happens. First off, we just need to acknowledge that this will happen. If you fall, don't give up. Here's my encouragement for you. Too many people, when they fall down, they stay down. You know what they say? They say, oh, well, <laughs> I blew it. Sorry. Guess I might as well keep doing this, or I might as well. You, know, you can't do it. The painful truth is God can help us recover lost territory. Hear that. He can help you recover lost territory. There is nothing he can't help you through. There's nothing he can't forgive for you. But the pain is, the truth is, our sin even though we can find forgiveness, still may have a few scars that we need to work through before we feel God's joy return. That's to be expected. It may take some sorrowing and some searching before you feel God's peace descend on you again. That's okay. That's normal. Work through those feelings as quickly as possible, deal with it, and then get back on the battlefield. The battle is too important, guys. We need you. We need each other. Get back up. Get on the horse. Ride back into battle. Don't let the devil keep you on the sidelines. Don't listen to his lies because he will come to you. He'll try to dishearten you and discourage you with his wicked whisperings. You call yourself a Christian? See, I told you, I tempted you and you fell for it. I tempted you and you, man, you're no good. You call yourself a Christian? I bet you're not even saved. Don't listen to that. Because here's the goodness. Here's what you can listen to. Here's what you can believe right here in 1 John 2. Dear children, I'm writing to this so that you will not sin. But, here's where but is actually a good but, right? It's, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. Church, our job is to repent, to ask Christ for forgiveness. He is the advocate. The Greek word used here is parakletos. You know what that means? That means literally someone to come stand beside you, to stand right beside you and say, I've got this one, Father. This one's with me. My blood covers that one. Oh, oh, that's so good. That's so, we could just end right there. My blood covers that one. Corey Ten Boom said this. This is so amazing. She says, when we sin and we confess, God takes our sins and he throws them into the sea of forgetfulness. And then he puts up a no fishing sign and says, no more. Don't get out your rod and reel and go fish and drag up those, that guilt and that shame. It's gone. And we have no business fishing in the sea of forgetfulness. If we've confessed it and we've repented, let it go. Don't let the devil come and remind you of your past, right? Remind him of his future. <laughs> See how quickly he scampers away then. He doesn't like that part, but he's all about whispering to you and trying to get you off course, trying to say, you're not worth it. Just, just go, go give in. Take the broad road. It's so much easier. If you sin, and we all do, our job is to take it one day at a time, to repent, to ask for forgiveness. And so, so I'm just going to leave you this challenge here. Here's your takeaway. If you boil it all down and you have to summarize everything we've talked about today, 
This is the most precious way I can think of it. When temptation is staring you in the face, we literally say to ourselves, I can't do that because I love God. I know a pastor who says that. He literally says that out loud when temptation comes away. I cannot do that because I love God. So here's the goal. When temptation comes your way, and it will this week, I want you to remember the cross. I want you to remember what he did there. The pain, the suffering, the mocking. Remember the cross, and then here's your job. Return that love by resisting that evil that's right before you, okay? That's your challenge. Temptation will come. It will come. Maybe it won't even wait till you get out the door. It might come at the buffet. <laughs> Woo, too soon? Sorry. Okay. That's our job. If you stumble, confess, repent, stand firm. We need you. Get back up on the horse and ride. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you for the power of your word. I thank you that it is sharper than a two-edged sword, and it has cut me a thousand times this week as I prepared this message. I thank you for that. Lord, we thank you that it never returns void, that it is alive and powerful. Now, Lord, we pray that you would chisel whatever off our heart that doesn't resemble Jesus, that you would do away with it as we confess to you. We ask for your cleansing blood to wash away our sin. Lord, help us to leave those sins in the sea of forgetfulness, never to be brought up again. Lord, we cling to you. We need you. We want to stand firm. God, would you give us power? Would you give us boldness? Would you give us the faith to do that? to stand for you in a world that just doesn't care. We love you. Thank you for the privilege to ask you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.